Hey everyone, this video is going to be a bit different. So today we're unboxing a switch kit. So this is basically an e-bike conversion kit. It consists of a front wheel, battery, and then a couple of sensors and stuff just to get it all going on your bike. It's a really easy way to convert an irregular bike into an e-bike. They make front wheels of quite a few sizes actually, up to 700C, I believe. So they do even make a Brompton size wheel but this is a 26 inch to fit like quite a few of my regular mountain bikes. So this is what comes with the switch kit. This is a handlebar mounted battery pack and it has a little controller on top. Then you can see the mount there in the top right. Then a sensor and the charger and plug adapter. So the kit came really well packaged. I removed all the packaging just for the video. If you've ever had a package show up and it's like beaten up or it's got like a tear in it or something like that um, you, you know what I mean it's just it's nice having good packaging <laughs> it just goes a long way when you have something that's of significant value that's coming to you so here's all the parts in the that comes in the kit it's really pretty simple it's just like a sensor the crank sensor and then the wheel and then the battery pack and a couple of cords so this is the battery pack here it comes in like this neat little case, it's a waterproof um, zipped up compartment, so that's it there. And on the back here there's just like a little switch to turn the battery on and off, that's just for packaging, just to keep it safe. So you can turn it on with it unzipped, or you can actually push a little q-tip and flick the switch without unzipping it. This is the battery mount here, it comes with like this little net thing to cover it. Pretty sleek really. This here is part of the sensor that detects when you're pedaling. So basically the kit works from pedal input. So you can get an optional um, thumb throttle but I didn't get that. And then you can also get brake lever cutoff switches which are basically just brake levers that um, have like a safety switch in them so when you activate the brake then it cuts power to the motor as well just an added safety feature and it, it's a really good idea to get that as well if you're like a an inexperienced rider or even just for the extra safety of knowing that if you pull the brake lever the motor is going to cut out so overall just a really nice really well thought out kit so the only thing now is to decide which bike I'm going to put it on. So I did get a 26 inch wheel because I've got quite a few 26 inch bikes. So that makes sense. And then I can put it on one and put it on another one. It's really easy to switch it over. So it's supposed to only take about 20, 30 minutes. So this is a Claude Butler. It's actually been modified to take disc brakes by the previous owner. It's quite a cheap pickup. These are my surly corner bars sitting on this, just for mock-up. I don't think it'll go on this though, I've got something else in mind for that. This is an old Scott Evolution. This is a really cool bike. Came with some old Dior XT parts and pace forks. Unfortunately though, this bike is a bit too small for me. So, I could ride it, but it wouldn't be as comfortable as I'd want. So this is me sitting on the bike now. It looks just a little bit too cramped. I also have this Specialized Hard Rock. The switch kick would go really nicely on this. It's a beautiful old steel frame. Really cool colorways on this as well. I think this is a 1989. Going by the decals and the placement of the brake. This would be a really cool contender. But I've already got a couple of Specialized already built up. And I think this would be nice to build for someone else. So what I'm going with is this GT Tequesta. These are some of my favourite bikes. I've got a soft spot for GTs <laughs> of this era especially. Pretty much any old GT that's steel I'll really like. I used to have one built up as a drop bar bike. Um, I think this is about three years ago now. And I sold it because ultimately it was a bit too small for me. This is the bike here, it's been on some really cool bike rides down the South Island and all over the North Island and stuff. So you can see I did use a riser stem but it was a bit too short, but 
Nowadays, I've got a Velo Orange Signy stem, which is a really tall stem. So this allows me to get the drop bars up nice and high, which is great for drop bar conversions and stuff, but specifically because this GT is too small. <laughs> so I find it really hard to find bikes in my size, even more so something in particular that I like. So I've been keeping an eye out for the past couple of years for a tall GT 26-inch um, mountain bike, but I just haven't found one. So I'm going to make do with the Velo Orange stem and just get it going because I just I really want another GT drop bike in my life. <laughs> so taking apart the things now. So I got this bike from a friend called James. I didn't know actually what condition the bike was in. Um, as it turns out, he'd serviced the headset and stuff, so <laughs> I didn't need to take this apart. But it's always good to check anyway. And from there, with the headset and fork out and everything, I can put some frame protectant inside the frame. That sort of just helps prevent rust build up on the inside of the frame in the future. So you can see the... It looks like James would crease the headset. <laughs> so this bike does have, like, internal cable routing underneath the top tube. I didn't know if there was, like, a one-piece tube that went through or what. Um, some of them have just like a little nub guide and then the other end it's just a little nub and you have to just guess where the brake cable goes. So to figure this out I put some brake clean through one of the holes and sure enough it poured out the other one. So it did look like it was just a one piece pipe going the whole way through which is really good to see because it just makes cable routing a lot easier. So once I saw that I could pull the brake cable out and then afterwards I'll put a new brake cable in. It was kind of strange putting it back in because it started hitting the seat tube. I didn't know what was going on. I thought, oh no, I've stuffed up. But um, it turns out it was just hitting the seat tube. Pulling the bottom brackets out now. Um, I don't think James had this out. Um, he said it might have been stuck, but it did end up coming out. N not too much um, drama, really. I have fought a couple of bottom brackets recently. So it's good to have one not completely stuck in the frame. So these GTs do have a 73mm bottom bracket shell, which is kind of strange for a steel bike. It's more common for alloy bikes to have a 73mm shell. It's not entirely uncommon though. It's just something to keep in mind if you're going to be building up one. So next, to prevent rust on the inside of the frame, I use Penetrol. There's Lots of different products. Uh, frame saver is one. You can use like a fish oil or sheep lanolin. Just try and find something that's close to you and that says that it's like a, a rust protectant or something like this. Um, I use this one because it's really thin and it spreads like a nice thin oil. So I can spray a bunch in the frame and then shake it around and know that it's going to get pretty much everywhere where I want it to go. The other thing I like about Penetrol is that it dries. So instead of just leaving like a thin layer of oil or whatever floating around the frame, um, it actually dries. So it becomes sort of like a, a thin clear coat. The only downside with this is, I guess in theory, it could trap moisture. But I mean, anything that you're spraying to coat the inside of the tubes is going to do that anyway. So the idea with this is to just spray it inside your frame tubes. Obviously only on steel bikes, just to prevent um, rust buildup internally. So you just spray it inside the frame tubes and sort of jostle it around. It's kind of hard to show it on camera, but you can like swing it around and stuff. Um, flip it upside down, spray it in, and then just keep going through all the vent tubes and everything. Making sure to not block any of the vent tubes, because this does set. So um, to, yeah, just keep in mind afterwards just go through and make sure that the, those vent tubes are clear as well after that just greasing up the seat tube and seat post and putting that back together just so it can sit in the work stand so you can see the paint here it's a bit beaten up it looks really good though the only thing is i didn't really like the plain blue it's just blue and then blue fork so i decided i would give it a bit of a paint splatter job 
So with keeping the original paint, I just went over the decals and everything with some masking tape and stuff. Then I used a bunch of my leftover cans. So the method I use is just spray a bit of the paint into one of the caps and then just throw it at it, basically. These are a few different colors. I really like how the pink looks against the blue. I've got a thing for pink at the moment though, so it might be not up to your standards. The lighter blues look really good against it too. Um, this is just sort of a coincidence. I thought it would look pretty good, but I didn't buy any paint for it, so it's just using sort of some of the stash that I already had. After that, I went over some of the patches of rust with some rust converter. So to do this, I just used some soapy water and then a scotch pad and then some isopropyl just to make sure it's nice and clean. And then I just use my finger to finger paint on the rust converter. I do this sometimes when there's only like one patch or two patches and I don't want to have to clean the paintbrush, but otherwise you just paintbrush it on. And then it just turns black, yeah. So greasing the headset and putting the headset bearings back in now. And then I can throw the fork back on. So paint splattering over the top is really easy and I, I think it adds quite a bit to the look of the bike. Just gives it like the pop of color. The only thing I don't really like is trying to match the fork to the frame. If you have it connected to the fork frame or not, um, sometimes it can be a bit tricky because you have to like rotate the fork and then you basically just keep looking at the frame and fork and try to like ma match and balance it out. Um, but really, it's as simple as. You just keep throwing paint at it until you're satisfied. Um, I try and do it like a couple of times and step back and look at it. It's kind of easier to do it like that rather than trying to remove the paint. So one of the only issues I have with the bike is that it's threaded steerer tube and I need to use a threadless stem. So I'll be using a pipe cutter to cut a section of steerer tube out just so I can use this cantilever brake cable stop on the cool stem, or the cool stem converter, I guess I should say. So a lot of these GTs have a cable stop built into the stem. I do like using the cable stops that go and mount to the fork, but um, I didn't have one of those sitting around, so I'm gonna be using this one. It normally just bolts onto the steerer tube of the bike. This one is for a threadless one though. So I need to build up that little bit of excess with a, yeah, just a little piece of a random steer tube that I had sitting around. From there, the Velo Orange Signi Stem bolts straight over the top of that. Then I can just align everything and get it all, get it all good to go. The handlebar I'm using on this, it's so wide, it's so wide. It, it, it doesn't really show in camera. Um, maybe like some still photos and stuff, you see it, but it's a ride far super wide bar made by Nitto. Moving on to the shifters, I wanted to try something a little bit different. So I'll be using barring shifters on the front of existing brake levers. There is a company that does this, um, I think it used to be called like Ret Retro Shift or something like that, but it's Givenall now. Givenall? I don't know. But I figured out a way to install barring shifters on the front of the brake levers. Cleaning up the brake hoods now. These are just some disgusting old Exage brake levers. Just, I just wanted to try something out without ruining really expensive brakes. So some brake clean, clean them up, and then I just used some soapy water to clean that off, and then some corn flour to remove the stick from the old sticky hoods. Pulling apart some of the brake lever now just so I can drill through and put the bolt through for the barring shifter. It's a pretty simple setup that I'm going to be using. Basically, I just need to drill a hole or a slot in the front of the brake lever blade and then put the bolt that attaches the barring shifter to the regular mount. Um, just put that through the back of the brake lever. So just marking it up where I think it needs to be and then drilling a couple of holes and making it into a slot. I just use my Dremel to sort of even this out. So this is the factory bolt for the barring shifters. 
It's basically just a backing bolt. Um, so I just trimmed down the sides of this, making sure to leave like a little lip on the like flat sides of it. That's just so it can hold itself in there. So the bar end assembly bolts to the other side of this and then you use a longer bolt to attach everything. But because this has the flat sides to it, it doesn't rotate under shifting, which is really nice. I read a few um, tutorials and stuff online and none of them were this simple. This is basically just bolting a bar and shifter onto the brake lever. I don't know, I don't know why some of them came up with like big crazy mounts and stuff. And you can trim it down as well to make it look a bit cleaner. But this is kind of like a, a testing situation where I didn't want to completely destroy the bar and shifter. So I can still turn it back to one and then just use it if I don't like the setup. The same as the brake lever really. It will have like a slot in the front of it, but it still functions just as a regular brake lever anyway. So you do want to mount the shifter above the pivot point of the lever. This is just so that you don't accidentally brake when shifting. I also put the shifter on a little bit of an angle. Um, as it turns out, this is probably not the best idea because the shifter goes past the brake lever. So it makes it like a little bit more awkward to shift back up. Um, so yeah, this is just testing out and out with the shifter just at the pivot point. And you can see it sort of shifted a little uh, and moved the brake lever a little bit. So putting it back above that pivot point, it just adds like some resistance. So the brake doesn't want to pull in as you shift. So I'm definitely glad I used some spare or sort of less desirable brake levers. I do really like the x ones that have the little rubber inserts in the lever blade, but these ones I don't like as much. So it shifts nicely. Um, it does feel better with the shifter down lower, but then, like I said, um, the shifting action actually pushes the brake lever as well, so you need it above that pivot point for the lever. Installing the bottom bracket now, I just use some waterproof grease like I do with the stem, like the headset and um, bearings and that sort of stuff. This is similar to a Park Tool Blue um, grease, but it's not that. It's like a, a waterproof high temp wheel bearing grease that I get at the local parts store. It's a nice viscosity and everything and I've used it the past couple of years and it's been really great. And it's cheaper than the Park Tool stuff, so another great reason to use it. So I use like a little bit of extra grease in there just to pro provide like a little bit of protection in case some water ingress gets in, like some cracks or anything. You just never know. These are the cranks I'll be using for the bike. I'm going to be setting it up as a 2 by 2 by 9 So just cleaning them up. I like using a toothbrush and WD-40 or a degreaser of some kind. I've got a big bottle of biodegradable cleaner. But it's kind of funny because I know it is just to reduce the impact um, on the environment, but you're using a biodegradable cleaner to clean off non-biodegradable products. So you still can't really dispose of the waste like anywhere. You still have to be careful with it. But um, it's just one less thing that's going to cause issues. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's still good to use. Um, so the cranks, I don't really want them polished up like, too much because none of the other parts of the bike will be. So I'm just going to be scu scuffing them like a little bit with some red scotch bike pad and then the grey one. I'm not going to be using auto sole afterwards like I would normally do. But I'm just going to leave them as like the satin sort of finish. Like I said earlier, we'll be doing a 2x9 setup. So the cassette we're using out back is 11 to 40 tooth or 42 tooth. Um, so quite a big range. And the chain rings I'm installing just for now are 36 and 46. So we'll be changing this out to a bigger one eventually. Um, I just want to do some testing and stuff and get it going. I'm still waiting on the 52 tooth. Um, <laughs> the 52 tooth will just give me like a little bit of extra top speed because I think that I'll be spinning out with the extra assist from the e-bike kit. But I just want to do a test ride first just to see if the 46 tooth is enough. But I have a feeling it's not going to be um, because the 26 inch wheels and stuff and the extra power from the e-bike kit, I think I'm going to be spinning out on the flats and stuff a bit more. So just throwing some pedals on now. These are just some old VP pedals I have sitting around. So a lot of the parts from this bike 
are going to be from the parts bin. Apart from these, U-brakes. So this GT in particular, and quite a few of them actually, have seat stay U-brakes, and some of them even have chain stay U-brakes. So basically it's just this, this funky little thing. It's sort of like a passover from BMX bikes. So you can't just use cantilever brakes on these posts because of the positioning and everything. And they're actually a bit shorter as well. So just putting some grease on just to prevent rust build up and stuff and keeping them nice and smooth. You can also use BMX U-brakes on these just in case you don't have the factory U-brake. Um, BMX U-brakes work really well on these and they do have like an individual spring adjust. The springs for these are inside so you basically just push them far apart and then tighten the bolts down and then that holds this, the spring and stuff in place. So you can see they're working pretty nicely. The tires we're going to be using on the bike are Schwalbe Hurricanes. These are the new compound or the new styling. They did do a Hurricane previously but it was a different tread style and everything. I have this on the specialized fixed gear sort of gravel uh, specialized single cross fixed gear bike. Yeah, sort of a gravelish tire, really good for commuting and stuff, quite fast rolling. The sidewall is a little bit too skinny. Um, I prefer it to be a little bit more hard wearing and stuff. The thing I like about Schwab tires is a lot of them have different levels of puncture protection. So these ones, I think these are the race guard ones. So they do have a couple of millimeters of puncture protection on the tread. Putting the front wheel on now, you can see those little safety tabs that are built into the fork were in the way, so I just filed them off. And then slotted the front wheel on. Just throwing the cassette on. Like I said earlier, it was 11 to 42. Or 40, 42. Yeah, it should give us a decent enough range, just in case the battery dies or I just don't want to run the battery setup. The 36 tooth up front, combined with this gearing will give us a nice amount of low ratio for most of the trails and stuff that I'll be riding on. It's working on the red derailleur now. You can see the pulley wheels were a bit worn and it was actually missing one. Like, I think I raided some of the parts off this or something. You can see the lower one was a bit worn anyway so it was probably a good time to replace the pulley wheels. So I just picked up some cheap alloy ones. These look pretty cool. They do come in different colors and stuff but I just wanted to be pretty plain with it. Only thing about alloy pulley wheels is they're a little bit noisier, um, but they obviously because they have the big cutouts they clear the grease and stuff a bit better, but um, they will block up <laughs> if, you're, if you're not careful and onto it with the maintenance and stuff. So it looks like this derailleur will clear the 40 tooth chain ring or 40 tooth cassette. Um, without the need for like an extender or any modification or anything like that. So as the chain puts tension onto onto the derailleur, it will shift it forward a little bit. So it should come forward and out of the way. It's a good idea to clean the factory grease off the chain because it is like the sticky rust preventative stuff. It's not like a regular chain lube. It's breaking the chain down to the right length. I think threading us through is kind of kind of tricky, but wasn't <laughs> wasn't too difficult this time. I think it did flick out of the red derailleur, um, but didn't put that clip in. Clicking the master link there, and using my favorite brake pads, Cool Stop Salmon Compound or Salmon Mixed Compounds. Um, they're just some of the best or the best brake pads for rim brakes. They're nice and gentle on your rims, but they also stop just amazingly. You can get them to work and clear in mud and rain and everything. So if you want your rim brakes to work a bit better, I definitely recommend picking up some Cool Stop um, Salmon Compound or the Salmon Mix Compound. Either or, they work really well. And then some Eagle 2s on the front. Someone mentioned uh, recently that they had um, sort of a squishy feel to them, but I haven't really experienced that. Um, so something to keep in mind that some people do have issues with the Eagle brake pad, just because it's a little bit thicker, I suppose might contribute to that, but I haven't experienced it personally. 
setting up the brakes now. I do like the straddle cable hanger first and then put the straddle cable through and then set the hanger to the right height based on the straddle cable angle. So you want it about 90 degrees for most cantilever brakes. Then just throwing through the gears now. This tire <laughs> didn't seat properly at all. I had to use some dishwashing liquid to seat the tires properly. The rear one was still not perfect though. So mounting the switch kit now, this is the handlebar mount and it's just two bolts to mount it, just a M5. So just getting it nice and even. So you can mount this pretty much anywhere that you'd like. Um, the mount will sort of attach to frame tubes and stuff, but the wires and everything are set up so that you should really mount it to the handlebars. This is the crank kit. So this is basically a magnetic pickup with a sensor that goes up to the battery pack. There's a couple of different little adapters that you can use depending on the spacing and stuff from your crank arms to the frame and everything. So just check out their little instruction sheet and you'll find out which ones you need. Those little adapters just slot in there and then you clip this back together. And then there's just a circ clip that goes around the outside of it that you just spring on to sort of work it on from one side to the other. You can see there that that assembly is zip tied or cable tied to the crank arm. You can use something else, I suppose like some adhesive foam or double-sided foam, something like that. But um, just to keep it nice and secure, I use some cable ties. Same with the sensor here. There is a little bolt here that you can adjust the angle of it. But for the most part, you want to get it sort of in position with zip ties. And then that just plugs up to the battery pack. That plug will only plug into its corresponding outlet. There are other plugs, so you can plug in the brake levers with the safety cutoff switches. And one big one goes down to the motor. And there's also another smaller one that is used for a thumb throttle. Thumb throttles are really good to use from starting out from a stop, but they're not legal in every country. So just powering it up, then adjusting a few settings. You can limit the power as well as a speed limit, but um, I just put everything to max <laughs> just, just because and then giving it a crank to see. <laughs> That's so cool to see. <laughs> and then just like a quick little lap in the backyard just to make sure that it's activating like evenly and stuff. And then just the last few finishing pieces like wrapping the handlebars and then I throw a rear rack on. There's a few different ways that you can wrap handlebars. I like to go bottom to top and then secure it with some elect electrical tape or like the finishing tape. Um, this seems to be the most secure and works the best for me. And then you use like a little bit of the extra piece under the hood. I've wrapped around the hoods multiple different ways and I don't really feel much difference here. As long as it's even top and bottom, then that's sort of the biggest part for me. Um, you can do like a figure eight around it or you can do like the half loop or like a full double. Um, I don't know how to describe it. But then up here I finished with some electrical tape and then used the finishing tape after that. Overall the tape felt like it was wrapping really nicely. Some of them have very little give and others have a little bit too much so it's hard to keep it even. But this was like a nice balance. The tape, my first impressions, uh, it feels really good. Um, it has like a nice grip feel to it. I do like the Chinelli cork and gel cork tapes but this was on special, and um, yeah, I just decided to try it out, give it a go. And that's pretty much the bike all together. Just got to throw the rear rack on, but that's just four bolts. And that's it. This is so good. So as you can tell by my face there, I was really impressed with the first ride. It feels a lot different to most of the e-bikes that I've used before. So a lot of them, they just feel like generic bikes. But because this bike is something that I'm really into, like it's an old steel frame, it's, it just feels so much nicer to ride. At the end of the video, I'll do a bit of a summary, but my first impressions, I'm really impressed with the kit. I thought this would be really cool to see. As you do wheelies, uh, the front wheel accelerates quite a bit. It's, it's, it's so fun to do. 
I managed to do a few little wheelies. I'm not really, really great at wheelieing, but I managed to get the front up and hold it for a couple of pedal strokes in the end. So you can see here the cable routing that I did. I taped a couple of them to like brake cables and stuff and then used some zip ties or cable ties to tidy up the rest of it. I quite like the positioning of the battery in front there because then I can change the settings and stuff. So I can power it up if I want some more assist and turn it down or off even if I don't want it. It's definitely worth noting that the front wheel, it doesn't really have much drag. I felt a few hub motors and some of them just have a lot of drag and you really don't want to be riding them with the power turned off. But this one, it feels really similar to riding a regular bike if you do run out of juice or if you just turn it off. Like there are some situations where I just don't really feel like I need the assist and I just want to like save the power for like another time or something. I've been averaging about 40 something kilometers to a charge. So my commute is about 18 kilometers. So I just charge it once a day just so I have enough juice if I want it. So the plan is to put the kit onto a different bike. So I'm going to be using this GT drop bar bike as just a regular non-assisted bike. But the timing just worked out well that I was building up the GT and then the switch kit, all of that showed up. And then I thought I might as well just put it on this bike because I can pretty easily swap it out for something else. So I want to talk a little bit about the front wheel unit compared to like rear wheel hub motors and mid drive units. They all have their ups and downs and comparing my little GT to this Trek is kind of apples to oranges. This is an 85 Newton meter full suspension bike with just under 200 kilometers on it now um, and it cost about 8,000 New Zealand dollars. So it's kind of difficult to compare them side by side but I just thought it would be a bit of fun to compare the two anyway. So the Trek is obviously quite a bit faster but there's definitely some big downsides about these mid-drive bikes that I don't really like. The biggest factor is the drivetrain wear. You go through chains and cassettes a lot faster with the mid-drive bike. You will go through brake pads a little bit faster with the bike anyway. You can sort of hear the mid-drive motor there going up the hill. The GoPro sort of picks it up a little bit quieter than the switch kit, but definitely in person. Um, the mid-drive is a lot louder. Three, two, one. So I did three or four runs on each bike and the trek was obviously faster by about two seconds, just under two seconds, 1.7 seconds was the average difference. Um, I tried to get the times faster by shifting in the trek and then that didn't quite speed things up but I actually ended up going fast, uh, slower because of the shift so I thought I'd go up a gear but um that, <laughs> that brings me to why I don't really like mid drive bikes just the drivetrain wear they're so much harder on components you'll snap so many more chains <laughs> on a mid drive bike this is under 200 kilometers and it just died. I'm pretty sure the chain would have been in a pretty good alignment as well because it was in one of the higher gears. I've mashed way harder on my Kona unit that has a similar spec chain, it's 12 speed and everything. And I've mashed way harder on that, but just because of the extra torque from the motor, um, which is insane that they create these motors and then the chain still can't even handle it. But I had the chain sitting around, so I slapped that on and called it, called it a day for the trek. Jumping back onto the GT, you can sort of hear that going up the hill here. So it's kind of hard to tell through the GoPro. In the editing, the switch actually sounded like it was louder, but in person, the trek is definitely noisier. It sounds, I guess, because it's like, gears like right underneath you as well but the GT it was slower from a stop but I don't know if it's because the GT was lighter than the Trek overall or what but I, I, I'm just surprised that it, the Trek wasn't a lot faster than the GT 
although two seconds over the short sort of stretch um, that gives you like some indication and certainly on a steeper hill and stuff the track would probably perform a bit better but yeah just a fun little comparison and the GT could ride home because it didn't break a chain it's definitely worth keeping in mind that if you're going to do a conversion that yeah you will definitely go through chains and cassettes a lot faster with the mid-drive conversion than you would with a hub, hub motor one. Now speaking of comparison to a rear hub motor, um, one of the downsides I've noticed is that it does make it a little bit more complicated to get the rear wheel out um, and considering most flat tires happen on the rear tire um, that's something to factor in. I haven't really found any downsides to running the front wheel it's, it's really cool to do wheelies and see the front wheel spin up and off-road you can get it to wheel spin if you lean back a little bit. Obviously you can tame this just by shifting your weight forward a little bit but just to have some fun. I wanted to throw some mud around a bit. So overall I really like the kit and I'm really impressed with it. Having the front wheel hub motor makes it easy to swap over to other bikes and stuff and there's no, really no downsides to it. Um, yeah, the, the weight is in the front, but unless you're doing wheelies and stuff, you shouldn't really worry too much about that. So I've used the bike in mud and through a bunch of rain and stuff, and through a cyclone actually. We had a cyclone um, a couple of weeks back, and the bike performed really well. Had no issues with the switch kit, and I've actually changed the switch kit over to my specialized hard rock as well. This bike is just like my general commuter and run around bike but I also see some single track use. So you might have not have seen this bike in a little while. I, I did do a YouTube video about it, but it's changed quite a bit since then. It handles towing so well. This is my Bob Yak trailer, and it has the spot single speed bike on the back of it. So the switch kit just gives me that little bit of extra power that I need to get up some hills and stuff, just that bit easier. Just means I can go further and I don't drain myself as much. Overall, I rate the switch kit very highly. I didn't have any issues with it, it's easy to set up and it performed just as I would hoped. Actually it was kind of better because this was a conversion on a bike that I really liked, apart from it being a bit too small, which leads me to this GT. <laughs> as luck would have it, two days after I finished the smaller one, this bigger one showed up. So now I'm building this up with the Kona P2 fork and that's going to be my drop bar bike. And the switch kit is going to go onto this Avanti Ridge Rider. So this is a local brand and this is going to be like a really sweet commuter bike. I'm going to do a video on this as well. It should be out in the next couple of weeks or so. I just need to get this video done and then I'll start working on the Avanti. Um, so yeah, something to look forward to in the future. So overall, really happy with the switch kit. There are a couple of things like the battery life and stuff that I think would be better if they were more improved. But this was the smaller version of the kit. Uh, they do have a bigger version and then I'm pretty sure there's a newer version that has a, an even longer range overall. With that said, this one certainly has enough range for myself and probably quite a lot of the commuters around. Um, another thing that I would like to see improved is a different mounting system. So either something that you can mount sort of a bit closer to the handlebars or something in a different position or even one that has like a couple of different mount styles would be nice. Um, it would be cool to mount this into like a frame bag or something like that so you can keep it well hidden. But it is handy for me to have access to the controls. That way when I'm towing or something like that, I can boost the power up when I'm going up a hill and then knock it back down when I'm going along the flats and stuff. So if they do change the mounting style, it would be cool to have a separate remote control that you can put in a position that's nice and close to where your hands are. But other than that, I don't really have any criticism for the switch bike kit. Um, did I mention that I don't like the levers, <laughs> the shifters that I did? Um, I'll be using Byron shifters in the next setup. Um, yeah, just it's too awkward to use in the drops and it's almost bad to use in the hoods as well. There's like a couple of gears where it feels nice, but other than that, yeah, didn't really like it. But oh well, it's nice to test these things out. So the switch kit will be coming back in the Avanti Ridge Rider video, so I'll be doing more testing and stuff. I'm going to do probably a bit more single track and stuff on it as well, 
just to see how it handles like a little bit more abuse so yeah check that out and i'll see you in the next one bye so i did end up getting the larger gt finished and this is the end result here i won't be doing a video on it because it's just so similar to this G smaller gt that i just did but i thought i'd show it off as well so yeah see you in the next one bye